start with is uh, the consent agenda uh, with a, a single motion we would like to uh, uh, approve the consent agenda items including the meeting agenda the October fund balance statement minutes of the October 19th open meeting substitute teachers list update and payment of monthly bills excluding payments to Cooper Lumber Brian Benson Larry Benson and Ron Wallace does anyone make the motion Michael makes the motion to have a second. Second. Mark seconds. All, uh, any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? It carries 7 0. Now we need a motion to approve payments to Cooper Lumber, Brian Vincent, Larry Vincent, and Ron Wallace. Does anyone make the motion? Michael makes the motion to have a second. Troy seconds. All those in favor? The uh, 4 0. And three abstentions, Fleetwood, Strong, and Johnson. Next, uh, we'll go into recognition of visitors, and no one has signed up to speak, so we'll go into the communications MSBA monthly uh, report. Parkway West High School in St. Louis County. 
You saw him earlier as he attempted to anchor the opening of this program. He remembered a high school English teacher who taught him not just to write, but also to think critically. You know, she had a favorite phrase. It was the uncomfortable middle. The uncomfortable middle. That's where she wanted us to be in our thing. No more black and white, simplistic, childlike thinking. We were no longer kids. She wanted to expand our minds and have us embrace complexity, look for truth and the answers to her essay questions um, in the rich, beautiful, gray areas of human understanding. MSBA presented Phillips with its Outstanding Missouri Public School Graduate Award following his remarks. Annual conference attendees also had the opportunity to hear from Natalie Hammond, the only adult survivor of the Sandy Hook tragedy that occurred in December of 2012. She shared her story of resilience in the aftermath of that elementary school shooting. She said it's critical that school leaders establish strong relationships before an incident occurs. So having that communication, having that relationship where you know your law enforcement, oftentimes by first name, and they know you, they know the procedure, they know your safety plan. They're able to come in and do lockdowns with you during a given school day. Someone yesterday said, you do the lockdowns while your kids are there? And I said, absolutely, why would I not? They have to know how to do it as well. And the cops come in and they do it just like they would normally do. They knock on the door, they identify themselves, they open up the door, nice job, boy, and then they commend them. Again, we're talking three to 10 year olds in my building. So they are little people. So we talk to them about nice job, way to keep quiet, Okay, you'll listen for the announcement when Mrs. Hammond gets on and lets you know that you're done. But that's part of the process and it's a relationship that we've built together. A highlight of this year's annual conference was the Student Showcase, where students from 13 school districts were on hand to present and discuss innovative programs in their school districts, such as a robotics program from McDonald County, an augmented reality demonstration from Columbia, and a wood shop and furniture design program from Rolla. The MSBA Delegate Assembly met during the annual conference and approved the association's new advocacy positions document that consolidates three previous documents that contained MSBA position statements on issues related to public education. This new document will provide the basis for MSBA's advocacy efforts during the 2018 session of the Missouri General Assembly as well as on the federal level. Governor Eric Reitens has made his fifth appointment to the eight-member State Board of Education. The latest appointment is Sonny Jungmeyer of Russellville. He replaces Joe Driscoll, who resigned from the board. The governor's latest appointment means his appointees now control a majority of the seats on the State Board of Education. All five new appointees to the State Board of Education are subject to Senate confirmation when the Senate reconvenes in January. Reports have indicated the governor wants the state board to replace current commissioner of education, Margie Van Dieven, with a candidate of his own. That's it for this month's edition of the MSBA Board Report. Thanks for allowing us to have some time at your board meeting, and so long from Columbia. Well, next we'll have uh, public comments, Dr. Dow. And we have a couple of things. Mr. Sawyer's going to talk about a couple different groups here. The, the first one is Larry and Debbie Chance. Uh, Board of Education, I would, uh, I see Debbie is here, but we'd like to recognize Larry and Debbie Chance. For the past several years, they have opened up their hospitality, their backyard, uh, to us for our annual or for our uh, cross country meet. Okay? Uh, Larry pulls up a flatbed trailer there for us. We got extension cords. They've just been, you know, the parkings out there in their front yard and, and down the sides and so forth. So uh, we owe them a great gratitude uh, for what they've done for us. And, and Debbie, we're glad you're here. I wish Larry could have been here, but I understand. And uh, but they have been super for us, and we do appreciate it. Thank you. Yes, I am. <laughs> Thank you. Turn around here and grab a picture real quick. We have to. <laughs> you ready? One, two, three. 
Thanks. Thank you very much. You know, we appreciate it. Yeah, it's fun. <laughs> oh, we could not. Fantastic. Now I have the honor of presenting to you the uh, 2017 SCA champs, the 2017 district champs, and quarterfinals for the 2017. Now this is one of two groups that have went undefeated in the SCA conference. Okay. This is the first group, well it's 12 wins, that's the most we've ever had. And at this point, I want to turn it over to Coach Swafford. And I tell you what, Coach Swafford and his staff have done a superb job and these young men are uh, uh, highly deserving of all the honors that they have received. Coach Swafford. I'm not for sure what I will need to say here. Um, uh, obviously we don't have all of our boys here. We, we've asked them to be at a couple places this week, and one of the here and we have a athletic banquet tomorrow night and so I threatened or I told them they need to have a suit and tie I said threatened didn't I I did that's a little slip there right uh, I told them suit and tie tomorrow night and everybody's eyes bugged out I don't have a suit well how about a tie I think I can do that coach uh, we're going to we're going to try to do that but I got a few guys here tonight and one young lady um they did a great job this year uh yeah I, I you know first off I want to say thank you to the school board and all the administrators. Uh, I don't know that you all realize what it takes to, to, to get the season going, to keep it going, and then when you have a run like this, it just takes a lot of effort, a lot of uh, coordination, and, and everybody has to work together if you want it to be done right. And that's exactly what we had. I had great support from uh, super, our superintendent, um, our principals, athletic director, outstanding support. I couldn't have asked for anything better. And so I want to just say thank you to all of you guys for that. Um, I want to thank the parents too. And, you know, I know we've got a few parents here tonight, but uh, uh, it's just a great commitment that you make when your son plays football, it was any sport for that matter, uh, that the time it takes to get them there, to pick them up. Uh, we, you know, watch film early in the morning on Mondays when I need, I need them there. And we practice, you know, sometimes late, sometimes, you, just, you know, it's just real, you just don't know for sure what time it's going to work out because you need it to be done right. And that's how I you know, feel about things. And, um, also, and I have a great uh, coaching staff as well. Um, you know, I, there's, no, I, there's no way I could take anything here and say it was my ideas. Or We all work together. Every one of our coaches that we have um, has a, you know, we all have our own little thing. Um, and for, you know, I got Coach Baird here tonight uh, who played for me. Uh, is getting his degree and he's just about there with his certification and uh, just does a wonderful job and I have a lot of other coaches that, that did a great job as well so anyway we just, I just want to say thank you um, to everybody here tonight and we appreciate everything you do and, and we hope that we can continue uh, representing Ava and, uh, and you know representing our community we appreciate it thank you Guys, why don't you call, come over here, and we'll just kind of get right in here and take a picture. Thanks, <laughs> 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 One, two, three. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys. Thank you, guys.
parents who attend leave with a set of free books for their children. Uh, we also provided free child care in the elementary cafeteria tonight so that those parents would be able to attend. Great. Thank you. Uh, next we'll have uh, high school principal, Dr. Nash. I'd just like to say a huge thank you to our students, our faculty, our community, um, other administrators for helping out last week. We had a lot going on with our play. Um, PEP assembly, we had students that qualified for SBU band, honor band. Um, we did walkthroughs, um, and last but not least, the big football game that we had. So thanks for everybody for making that run smoothly. Also got a note from Mr. Lakey tonight, and they are at um, FFA District Speech Contest, and we have three students, Dwight Emerson, Eden Little, and Reagan Swadish, who have made it to finals. So they'll be competing in finals tonight. Thank you. Next, we'll have a special services director, Mrs. Swafford. Hi. I just wanted to thank um, all my staff. We had parent-teacher conferences. We had lots of IEP meetings. They kept very busy um, coordinating with parents when they were in just to make it convenient. And um, keeping up with paperwork, I think we've enrolled six students this week that have transferred in with, um, that need services. So they've worked, they're working really hard to get paperwork up to date. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Next, we'll have the uh, maintenance director, Mr. Valentine. Demolition of the houses is almost completed. Uh, we need to sow a little grass. We need to get a little chat in, in a few places, but I think it looks really good, and we're just about done. Thank you. Next, uh, the good services, uh, Mrs. Edmore. Yes, I have two plaques to present. One to Dr. Hall, and one to Mrs. Swadish for the, there's a healthier U.S. school challenge. Um, the elementary is now silver which comes with a $1,000 uh, money. Uh, Monica said that had not received it yet and the school can spend it however they want. And the bronze is $500 and that goes to the use of Scottish for the middle school. But the Health Rate US School Challenge, I wanted to share a little bit with you. I don't know whether you're familiar with it or not, but it's um, the Health Rate US School Challenge is a smarter lunchroom. It's a voluntary certification incentive recognizing the schools that enrolled in team nutrition that has created healthier school environments through promotion of nutrition and physical activity. Since the beginning of this, in 2004, awards have been given to schools in 50 states in the District of Columbia. As of September the 28th, 2017, there are 2,983 schools that are certified. And bronze is 2,067 and silver is 733 and gold is 152. So it's quite an honor to get this. and. Uh, I'm really excited. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Do you want a picture? <laughs> <laughs> uh, thanks. Uh, we'll go into the executive administration reports. Next. All right. Um, they, they talked about it briefly on the MSBA video, but I think if that video was made later, in, within the last few days, I had a little bit more to talk about with what's going on with the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. Um, it appears um, very evident that um, our Commissioner of Education is under attack from our governor. Um, as they talked about, the governor has appointed five members, new members to the Board of Education, to the State Board of Education, and he is politicizing those appointments. Um, by nature, the, it has to be four Democrats and four Republicans. It, ha, it cannot be have a majority of any party. Um, but it's become, like I said, it's become evident that he feels like he needs to replace the commissioner. Um, why? I'm not sure. Um, Dr. Van Dieven took over in January, I believe, of 2015 and has done an outstanding job. She's the first commissioner we've had in the last 10 years that's actually listened to um, <coughs> school districts, teachers, parents, superintendents from around the state. Um, she's really unified education in the state of Missouri. Um, he has brought in um, a gentleman to visit this summer from Atlanta that's been in charge of a charter school expansion program. Um, and. Our understanding is he doesn't want it to be an open process when, if he does replace her, he just wants them to appoint um, the person that he wants. So school districts, administrators, and teachers from around the state have kind of started kicking back against him. They have called a special board meeting next Tuesday. And as you know, I'm the president of the Greater Ozarks Cooperative School Districts, which represents 
um, north of 100,000 kids in 40 plus school districts, 44 school districts in Southwest Missouri. Um, we have a meeting tomorrow, um, and I will rep be representing that group in Jefferson City on Tuesday at that meeting. Um, though it is a closed session, they have to go into open session just like we do. Um, and we anticipate a huge turnout of superintendents from across the state at that meeting. Um, we have written, let written letters to the to the governor. We've written letters to um, the state board, encouraging them not to um, state board not to, for lack of a better word, listen to the governor at this point, because um, they don't know Dr. Van Dien. Most many of them have only been on the board for a couple of months, um, and not to not to let that pressure get to them. We think we're making progress at this point. We don't know that they have the votes. That needs five votes. Um, one of his appointees um, has come out publicly and said that he will not vote in favor. Um, so that's, we know four um, for sure that are against her, or not against her, that are for Dr. Van Dieven. And if it's 4-4, four, four, um, the motion fails. So we think we have it licked for now. Um, I don't, it, it's probably an inevitable thing, though, at this point, um, but we're going to make it difficult on him because we feel, again, we feel like um, she is taking the state in the right direction. Um, her passion and support and vision for education in the state of Missouri um, is as good as I've seen it since Dr. King, um, Kent King was the commissioner. So um, I, I will be the first one to say when um, she applied for the job, I was hoping they would hire Doug Heider. I'm superintendent in Branson, but she has done an outstanding job since she got since she took office. Um, so, anyway, um, it's I think if he wins the battle, it could set ed education back in the state because um, we have a lot of things going. MSIP six is coming. She's worked with school districts. She's worked with administrators and teachers and groups from across the state. To develop MSIP 6, which is our scoring guide, um, which we'll talk about MSIP 5 tonight, um, and how that's been developed. And I would guess all that would go um, by the wayside. And we don't know what it would do with her staff either, with, you know, because the commissioner gets to choose their staff, so they might turn over several people um, that we've come to trust and we believe in. So I'll let you know as soon as I know a little bit more. So. Um, been working on with Carla and some other people about our lunch charge procedure. It's not something I told you that I'd bring you a copy. I have a draft, but I didn't bring it tonight because it's not done yet. It's not something we would implement this year anyway. So I want to keep tweaking that draft and make it a little better before I bring it to you. Um, but people, Teresa Stillings, who works with it um, extensively in our office, and Carla have both read that draft. And, have made some suggestions for change for me, so we're going to keep working on that and try to bring you a solid draft when it comes to you. Um, so we're making progress there. Just a reminder that board election sign-up starts December 12th at 8 a.m. Um, to January 16th at 5 p.m. Um, the doors will open um, December 12th. The doors will be locked, and, but they will open at 8. And it's first come, um, first person there is the first person on the ballot. Um, our office will be closed um, December 25th to, through January 1st um, during that period, but it runs from, again, December 12th to January 16th. Staff holiday open house in this room is December 18th. I encourage you to stop by if you have time. Teachers will come and go on their plan periods. And we kind of feed them some snacks and there's gifts and um, just a good time um, to celebrate the holiday season. The last thing I have for you, Monty, updated you on the houses. I think they're, I think they sh should have finished up today, and they were just cleaning up trash and smoothing out the, 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 um, the dirt. But it looks, looks a lot better. Um, that was what we were obviously going for. We're working on now the, um, trying to get some bids on, um, a building, a storage building that we're going to put, the one we tore down, neck in place of the one that we tore down. We have lots of needs for storage in this, in this district, and we don't have any storage facilities, so we're going to build a pole barn type of building. Um, you all will be um, getting notice by email from the Missouri Ethics Commission. Um, you have to fill out a form, and it, it really is a, 
says that you've not received in excess of five thousand dollars from the school district um, or substantially benefited from the school district because of your role on the board of education each member according to board policy has to fill it out um, you have to fill it out for your spouse as well so you'll have to put that your spouse um, works for the school district it's not a hard thing to do i have to fill one out every year um, even when my wife taught i still had to fill one out so um, but you do have to do that just wanted to remind you of that um, i thought it was interesting um, then MSPA, then MSBA report talked about Mr. Constantino says you can't legislate trust, and I think that's what the governor is trying to do with our commissioner. Um, they also talked about a safety committee um, with Sandy Hook, and uh, Mr. Howe is um, has started or is, is starting a safety committee in our district to look at our safety procedures. Um, he's got several teachers, several district employees, a couple board members on that safety committee. Um, they're going to review our safety procedures. We do safety training. We do drills all the time, but we're going to look at what we do and make sure it's the right thing. We're going to look at best practice um, and update those policies and procedures. Um, the good thing is we know our officers by name. Our teachers know our officers by name. Um, now they're in our buildings all the time, so we're comfortable with that. They have keys and they have access to our buildings, but I think it, it, it's always um, intelligent of us to look at what we do and make sure it's the right thing and it's just not what we're used to so look for more information on that um, as Mr. Howe um, gets that committee up and running and, and they get to work um, there's a lot of work to do but um, he's got a great group of he selected a great group of people to work with him to get that done so that's all I have Mr. Dalton I mean, we've been talking about the last couple of months, anticipating getting our APR, which Dr. Dow mentioned, MSIP 5. These are the report cards, statewide uh, districts are assessed by, these are the guidelines. So I'm gonna take you through our APR report this evening. I'm gonna try to explain to you the process, how the points are totaled, uh, show you where we've been in the recent, recent past, uh, and at the end, I'll show you a comparison of where we compare to our other conference schools. I know a lot of times just have a point of reference, uh, you know, give you a scale of to kind of compare what you're looking at. Um, so as we start through this, what you see there with MSIP 5, there are five categories that all K-12 school districts are measured by. The first one is academic achievement. That's the single biggest area. If you see that there, it's worth 56 points. These points are earned through our MAP tests and our EOC tests. And that's where those points come from. Uh, the second category you see there is subgroup achievement. For us, what that group is made up of are students on free and reduced lunch uh, and students receiving special services. For us, that's what that's gonna be made up of. And again, that refers to the performance of those students on the MAP and EOC tests. The third category there you see, college and career readiness. And when we get into that, it's broken down further uh, into three different categories. Uh, we'll get more specific as we go to them, but uh, different assessments, ACT, uh, things like that the students are taking, uh, placement after graduation. Uh, those are some categories that, that that's made up of. And you can see that it's, there are 30 points possible uh, in that category. Fourth one is attendance. There are 10 points possible there. The last one you see is your graduation rate. 30 points possible in that category for a total of 140 points. Okay. Now I'm going to try to scroll down here. We're going to lose part of it. But what you will see there, and I'll move across, I've got this back to 2013. Uh, there in the bottom in yellow, that's the percentage of the points that we earned. Just above that are the total number of points. So in 2013, you can see we were 127.5. 2014, I'm going to scroll over here. You should be able to see all of those. Okay. So what you see, the last four years we've been we were between 95 and 96, nearly 97 percent. This year we earned 134 points out of the 140 points possible, and that's very good. You see that we own 95.71% of those points. Um, 
we will get into where that's all made up of and, and broken down into as we go. Um, you can see there on the right hand side the percentage of the points we earned in each category. We have 96.43 percent of our points from academic achievement and that subgroup that we talked about uh, just under 90 percent there. 100 percent of our college and career readiness you can see 100 percent also from our graduation rate and then the 75 percent is on attendance and we'll tell you what that's made up of when we get to that area okay everybody good on the first tab there again the single biggest area we talked about was academic achievement and again that is made up of our map and eoc scores so what you're looking at <laughs> as you go across and i have listed 2015, 2016, 2017. What the state does, the first way you can earn points, and you can see there it says three-year status. There are two yellow boxes and then two that are green. Uh, the first measure, the largest way that schools earn points is their three-year status, and it's a three-year average. Now, I need to explain to you what those numbers mean, just to give you a point of reference. Uh, so every student that takes a MAP or EOC, depending on where they score, they're going to receive a score that either is an advanced category. Every student that scores in the advanced category gets five points. They can score proficient. Any student that scores proficient is four points. Basic, that's three points. And then you go to below basic, and that's one point. So simple way I think about that if all of our students scored advanced it would be 500 points that's the scale we're looking at there you see most of those numbers are in the 300s if every student in the district scored proficient it would be 400 points if every student scored basic it would be 300 points okay and then if everyone were below basic that would be 100 um, so to mix it up a little if half of our students were proficient half of our students were basic, you would have a score of 350 points. Obviously, we've got students in every range, so that gives you kind of a point of reference when you're looking at those numbers to figure out how those are calculated. Every student we have that takes an assessment, there's a point value assigned to where they score, and then that's where this is generated from. So that three-year status, it's just an average of our previous three years. And then you can see and I've tried to color code that. I don't know if that helps or not. Um, there are four categories, and I'm going to scroll down here, and then I'll come back just to show you what, how these are figured. In MSIP 5 first come out, there were some target scores established. You see that top one there is a 2020 target. If schools score high enough to fit in these various ranges that you see listed for the different content areas, then you're going to get full points. ELA, our English tests are worth 16 points. Math is worth 16. Uh, science is worth 16. Social studies, that's what you see in parentheses beside that. Social studies is worth a maximum of eight points. Reason being, the only social studies in the course exam that's administered is in government. There's just one group of students that takes that. In math and ELA, every student grade three through eight takes a math and an ELA assessment. And then you also have algebra one and English two typically. Now we've already talked about that. For this year, those scores are not included here. Um, science, you have fifth grade, eighth grade, and then high school biology. So you have multiple grade levels that take that assessment. Okay, so when you see some of these colors as we go across, you have that 2020 target. On track is the next level down. You can see those various ranges. Uh, that'll be those green boxes you'll see. Uh, that means schools will be on target in the way that's projected to meet that 2020 goal. The ones that are yellow are approaching. And then in the red would be the floor. Okay? Now, those are status points. That's based on your three-year average. For your last three years, those are average. That's the first way schools can earn points. Okay? Now I'm going to slide over here. It'll take the longest to explain all this as we go through the rest of it. 
This will go more quickly. The other way schools earn points is through progress. Uh, and that's what you would think it would mean. If you are improving as you go, you're going to earn progress points. So what you see there, a school could earn as many as 12 points in ELA, math, science, and progress, uh, six points in social studies as a maximum. And then you see the decreasing values depending on how much they've, that you've improved in that particular area. The last way that schools can earn points is in growth. Um, this only applies to students in fourth through eighth grade. And it only applies to math and ELA, which you see there. Reason being, that's what I was talking earlier. Every student grade three through eight takes a math and English assessment each of those years. Well, how those points are determined, uh, I was reading through this. Every student statewide, they take a third grade English test, they take a fourth grade English test, just for example. Well, that's a data point. So every student that has taken a test in back-to-back -back years, those points are analyzed. Uh, there's a baseline set for what would represent expected growth. So schools can earn growth points if you've exceeded what would be expected of students statewide. That's how that's determined. Um, there are a lot of numbers involved in how they figure that. But that's, those are three ways that schools can earn points in this particular category. Your status, which is based on your three-year average. Your progress, which is based on if you're improving from year to year. And then growth, which is individual students in grades four through eight. All right, those are the ways schools can earn points. So I'll go back up here and we'll actually look and see where we are. So again, three-year status was first. So in ELA math, we are approaching. So there's a certain number of points we earned there. Science, we're on track. Or I'm sorry, science, we are at the 2020 target. Social studies, we're on track. So you slide over, what you see in the red there, that's the progress. Okay? And if you look at 2015, 2016, 2017, uh, what they do is average 2015, 2016 together, then they average 2016, 2017 together. And if there's enough progress shown, there are points that can be earned there. Uh, you can see we did not in any of those categories. Now, you slide on over here to growth points in this column. And again, that only applies to math and to ELA. And these are students only in grades four through eight. And you can see math earned six growth points. Now, you go over to the right, and here are the points we actually got credit for for this last school year, for 2017. This, so ELA, we got all 16 points. Math, we got all 16 points. Uh, science, we got all 16. And then in social studies, we got six. Now, if you look back through, some of those numbers don't add up. Okay, and here's the reason why. And again, every school in the state is operating under the same guidelines. So this kind of touches on what Dr. Dial was talking about as far as the state department of education. There have been so many changes you know, with staff, we talk about it seems like sometimes that target moves. You know, you're, you're preparing students here, your standards, you're getting them ready for what they're going to face and be held accountable for. Well, those standards have changed multiple times during the course of this process with MSIP 5 that Dr. Dial was talking about. The Department of Education recognizes that. So they've adjusted the scoring guide that schools are being measured by. Uh, they call hold harmless points. I was talking to teachers about that. Basically, it's hey, we kind of have there's a curve in place here because of some of the changes that have taken place. Uh, you know, they analyze this data, they look at the results. Uh, you know, if, if because of the change in either the assessment, you know, our vendors change from time to time, and it, when it impacts the results, that's where some of these hold harmless values come in. So for this year, we earned full points: ELA, math, science and then six out of the eight points possible for social studies. That's where you come up with the 54 out of 56 points possible there. So again, uh, that, that's, that's very good. 
questions on that particular slide, guys, I promise that'll be the one we'll talk the most about. The rest of them are a little more straightforward. There's a lot of information there on how that's calculated. <coughs> So everybody said there are three ways you can earn points. Your current status, the progress you're making, and then growth. Uh, the cut scores change. The cut scores change as, as they go along as well. Right. Um, it, the data is analyzed each year to see where the cut score should be. And that's how the MPI, which you talked about, a three-year rolling average, that's how that is figured. So a group of, a group of people from across the country um, consult with the department that they're psychometrists so that's what they that's what they do every day and so they work with the department to analyze that data and that's they're the ones that actually found the issue with the algebra and English at the high school level and said hey these aren't valid scores so it's just not some people in Jeff City that do it it's a group of experts from around the country and we, have, we went over this data with, with teachers during our early out yesterday. And what we talked to, to teachers, you know, when we had our first early out of the year, we started the process that, that we used with students. Our teachers are doing it every day. You know, we're making sure we're aligned to standards. We're preparing our kids for what they're going to be held accountable for. We're monitoring kids' progress throughout the year. That's something we've talked about a lot, formative assessment. Uh, different instructional strategies. You know, if I've got... We've gone through a unit, students are still struggling, we're gonna come back and, and try another strategy to try to reach those students. Uh, so our teachers, you know, I know we were talking about the delays on getting this information, but there's a lot of data we already had. There's a lot of work that you can do to prepare for when you do finally get this. Uh, so we do, we feel like teachers and principals, there's a lot of the groundwork foundation that needs to take place is already, it's in process. Now that we actually have this, yeah, we've got specifics on where we were, what our report card looked like, uh, and we're working on it. We met with groups of teachers today, and we'll continue to do so. Just work on the specific areas, needs that they have. Uh, just try to help them prepare our kids. All right, we'll go on to the next one. The next group is that subgroup achievement. Same guidelines, same three ways that you can earn points. Again, these are our students made up of, predominantly for us, it's going to be free and reduced, students receiving special services. Uh, again, you have your three-year average, you look math and ELA, both of those are approaching, those are the yellow boxes you see there. Science and social studies that are in green, both of those are on track. Those numbers are good. You go over, again, the progress points that you see there, again, 15, 16 numbers averaged compared to 16, 17. You're looking for a certain amount of growth there to qualify for points. Um, we didn't receive any additional points in the progress. We scroll on over. Status, those are the points there in the yellow and green boxes. Progress and growth. We go all the way over, you can see how many points we are. Four for math and ELA. Three in science and then one and a half in social studies. That's where we get the 12 and a half out of 14 points possible in that, in that particular category. Again, same methods we use to determine those points. Questions on the subgroup achievement, everybody. Again, those are our MAP and EOC scores. We'll go on in college and career readiness. It's broken down into three categories. This first one that you see here, there are benchmark scores identified at the state level. Dr. Dow kind of touched on that. There are people that do this statistical analysis all the time. So there are benchmark scores established for ACT tests. For us, ACT, ASVAB, work fees, I think are the ones that uh, our students utilize the most. Um, and if you'll look, 2015, 2016, 2017. What this is, are the percentage of your students that are at or exceed that state benchmark. You see 2015, the first year I've got reported here, we were 64.3% of our students. You moved to last year, it was just over 80% of our kids. That's significant. That's significant growth. 
And the way that works, you have all these different assessments, and, and most of our kids will take multiple ones of these assessments, and they get to count whatever their highest score, whichever assessment, uh, basically earned them the most points, that's the one they get to, they get to have credit for. Uh, so then when you look at our three-year status, we meet the 2020 target. You have just three years uh, doing very well in this category. Now, it's a little bit different on the progress here, but you see we got 10 point status, which is the maximum. We also have earned the maximum number of progress points. When I was sharing this with teachers last night, you don't, get, you don't get bonus points. The maximum you can get in this category is 10. We earned 10 for status, also seven and a half for progress. So again, students doing very well here. I know this has been something Dr. Nash, uh, Mrs. Burke, all have focused on and worked on. And, uh, obviously, teachers preparing the kids well. They're doing a good job here. So we are in full points there. Next category with college and career readiness. Uh, this one, uh, for us, predominantly, it's going to be students, uh, dual credit classes, uh, TSA or IRCs. You might hear that in career and technical ed classes. Uh, so again, there are benchmarks here. It's earned in a certain, a certain grade in those dual credit classes. Uh, it's passing one of these TSAs where you're receiving an industry uh, recognized credential. That's an IRC, another name you'll hear there. But again, if you look, 2015, 48.6%. You look to 2017, just shy of 70%. <laughs> So again, tremendous improvement. You look at our three-year status, <coughs> we're on the 2020 target. Um, you slide over. We also earn progress points there because of the improvement that we were showing. So we earn full points there. Again, I know that's something Dr. Nash, Mr. Halleck, uh, Mrs. Bergdahl in the high school have focused on. And, uh, kids are doing well there also. Questions on that part of college and career readiness? The last 10 points that fit in that category, uh, this is basically <coughs> postgraduate placement. Uh, what you'll look there, are they going on to higher ed? Are they going to some sort of industry training, on the job training, military, or a, a field related to their career and technical ed program that they completed in high school? And you can see here our scores are, are very high all the way across. Uh, you know, our students are going into some kind of field related to what their training, uh, their focus was in, in high school. 96% in 2015, just shy of 87% in 2016, and last year was 97%. This takes a lot of legwork from the high school to follow up. <coughs> Time of tracking. You, I mean, phone calls. You know, you, you have some ways to track it. Some of those kids don't fall within those tracking methods, so... They have to, you know, they have to get a hold of those kids and find out what they're doing. And then they have to, okay, so you are doing, you're a welder. Well, was that a track you took through high school? Because they took three ag classes, so they become a concentrator. And, and, I mean, it takes a lot of work. And those people, and they do a great job at the high school level of keeping track of that and making sure they're, they're talking to kids and, and knowing as, as they leave how to get a hold of kids once they leave. So we just appreciate their work in doing that. Um, because if you don't do it, you don't get those points. So again, you look there, we earn full points in that category as well. So that's where you saw the 30 out of 30 points for college and career readiness. The next category was attendance. Uh, the state's <coughs> goal for attendance for everybody statewide when at least 90% of your kids to have at least 90% attendance. That's the goal. Uh, you can see for us the last three years, we're right around 88, 89%. See 88.8, 88.7, 87.7. Um, I know we talk about this in the office, building principles this is something they, they spend a lot of time working on. You know what you'll see, those 88, percent of the students, they're here 95 plus percent of the time. Uh, you know, and then you have a very small percentage that, uh, you know, it's just a struggle. You know, things we focus on, and, you know, you talk about attendance incentives and different things like that. 
I know research shows you're trying to get those kids connected, whether it's an extracurricular program of some kind, some kind of activity. You know, when those kids connect and make those, again, build those relationships, I'm going to show up. So that's something we have lots of conversations about, just different things we can try to do to, to get kids here. So you see, again, it's not where we want it, you know, but we're, um, we are on track to reach the target. You see there our three-year status is 88.4, um, which represents 7.5 points. It didn't go up when you took the 15-16 average compared to the 16-17 average, so we didn't get any progress points there. So that's where we have 7.5 out of 10 points possible there on attendance. And that's district-wide, that's every building, is where that's measured from. And that, that is measured if a kid's here for two weeks. A percent of his, yep. I mean, he doesn't count as a full FTE, which is full-time equivalent, but he counts as a portion. But, I mean, each kid, if they're here for a day or 168 days, counts towards this average. And that's tough. You know, a kid that just moves in and out, it, it, what we were just talking about, it's hard to get that kid yeah. connected to something. You know, if they just come for a little while and then they leave, uh, you know, obviously there, there's some change taking place in homes, whatever's going on there. But that is, that we're held accountable for every part, whatever points in attendance they're here. All right, the last one's graduation rate. Um, state calculates four, five, six, and seven year graduation rates. Schools get to take credit for whichever one's the highest. If you look at ours on the three-year status, all of them would be worth full points. Okay, and if you look, you know, for us, basically, once, you know, four-year rate, 2015 was 95.3, 2016 was 97, 2017 was 92. Then you move down, once it gets to that fifth year, you know, when you see 98, 99% for us, that, that basically, that represents one student. There is a student that didn't finish in that five year time frame. So what you're seeing, you know, you move down to six and seven. Again, a lot of work done at the high school to, you know, whether it's alternative school or credit recovery, trying to work with those students uh, to finish and, and get their diploma. That 92% could, could represent a special ed student that is graduating on goals is a special ed student has the right by law, by federal law, to stay until they're 21. So if they are graduating on goals and not credits, so their goals may be that they're in school for six years, which is perfectly fine, but that knocks down our four-year graduation rate. Right. That's why Desi in the beginning only had a four-year rate. They've expanded that because they begin to understand and listen to practitioners in the field that said listen by federal law we have to keep them six years and we should um, so they expanded that to a five six seven year graduation rate. so again you're not seeing progress points there because we're already at the you know we're at the goal uh, so how whichever measure you use we'll be earning full 30 points out of 30 points possible there okay those are the five categories Here's the comparison in the SCA, and I'll scroll over we can see all this, just for a point of reference. So these are our conference schools. What you see across the top, those S1 categories, all of those are academic achievement. I'll scroll down, scroll down one more. And that cuts off part of it. Then you'll go over, I'll try to come back and forth there so we can see what we're looking at. You just go over a little ways. S2, that's that. Category two, subgroup achievement. ELA, math, science, social studies. S3, those are the college and career readiness categories we talked about. S4 is attendance. S5 is graduation rate. Okay, I'll go back. Again, these are alphabetical for our conference schools. This is where we ranked in each category. And then we go over, I'm going to go all the way over. Overall, out of the conference, we were second. Salem uh, earned 138 out of 140 points, whereas we were 134 out of 140 points. Our 95.7% there that you see of points earned 
We put us second out of the eight schools in the conference. Again, it's a good school. Are there things we are focused on and working on? Absolutely. We've been doing this since our first meeting. Teachers are, are doing that work. Uh, and we talked about some of the things you know, that the principals are doing at those levels also. And those grade level team meetings, those early out meetings, these are some of the things we focus on and talk about. Questions there? All right. I just have one comment. This is the first time in 15 years when APR came out that I didn't have to be the one to explain it. <laughs> <laughs> so I am thankful for that. Um, I am truly thankful for that because it, it is a complicated system. You have to understand how points are gained. And I appreciate um, Mr. Dalton. He hit the ground running. I didn't have to explain things to him. He knew it. Um, he's worked with it before. But I feel way more comfortable not being the only person in the district that understands it the way it should be understood. Um, so I appreciate him and the work he does with this to truly understand it and explain it to staff, explain it to teachers, and, and he's the one meeting with the building principals um, and the grade levels on what they're doing and tracking kids, and, and he has a great understanding of that, and I, I just appreciate what he's doing. You know, not very far into the job, um, you wouldn't know it. Um, it's hit the ground running, and it's gonna make us better and push all of us to that next next spot. We're never satisfied. <coughs> We're not, if that said 140, we're not satisfied because the next year it may not say 140. So we're going to keep working. Um, you know, we talked about hold harmless. That scares us a little bit. Some of those are going to go away, and, and we're, we've got to improve in some areas. Um, you can see that by this chart. Um, we're not number one in every every area, and I don't want to be average. And I don't think anybody in this district wants to be average. So we don't compare ourselves versus the state average because I don't want to be average in the state. So. And, I, and nobody else does either. So you know, we're going to keep improving and keep getting better. So we're happy, but we're not satisfied. I have a question. Yes. On the, I think the college and career readiness. Yes, sir. We had made significant gains in, in uh, the score. Mm -hmm. Did the bar raise or lower? I mean, how 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 did we achieve that much gain? Well. And, and probably Dr. Nash could talk about that as well as anybody, but um, we've done a better job of tracking kids. Uh, if that's the category he's talking about, I think that's the category. We've done a better job of tracking kids um, and trying to help kids focus on really what they want to do and help them find those fields that they want to be involved in. Um, but the bar's not changed, and we've just we've improved in what we do. Some of that I know that they do, and I'm, I know Dr. Nash and Mrs. Bergdahl are working on that now. Part of it's going through and making sure every kid has the opportunity to, every kid's taking an assessment. If, if they qualify to take the ACT again for free through uh, a waiver, boy, hey, this is going to benefit you, here's what it is. Making sure that kid has an opportunity to do that again. Uh, you know, do, and Dr. Dahl touched on it, doing a good job of tracking where the kids are at what they still need to do that's going to benefit them. I know I've done a ton of work with our uh, CT&E programs, our career and technical ed programs, uh, making sure kids, you know, fine, well, you're not on the college track. We're going to have something here that's going to benefit you. Uh, doing a really good job of making sure kids have opportunities to walk away with some kind of certificate or industry-recognized credential that they could potentially use once they leave here. So doing a good job of that. Identifying those areas, making sure we're training them and preparing them for it. You know, I know that's something they put a lot of work in on. Interesting conversation with an employer here in town that um, I had with him two weeks ago. He's, look, he's looking for a kid that um, he can train, that has some interest in his field. He's willing to provide all of the training, benefit, health benefits, and a full-time job. But he's looking for the right kid that wants to make a career out of his business. And so I just happened to be um, with Mr. Lakey talking to him about some kids. So we started talking to some kids and we've got four or five names for that man to sit down and interview. Mm -hmm. And 
If it works out and that, and that young man goes to work for him, he will make a great living. A great living. And he'll have a job for the rest of his life. Um, with, with health benefits. Um, but that's, you know, this guy, he's, he's done that twice now. He's hired two of our graduates and trained them to do this job. And they're good people. They're great contributors to, to our district. They have, they're married and have kids in our district and um, great supporters of our district. He wants to do it with the third one. So, it's having those types of conversations too. You know, when, when our businesses start to trust us and, and they're involved and they believe in the school district, they want to hire our, our graduates. Okay, Joe, thank you. Next, we'll go into uh, discussion and action items. And uh, first thing is the 2017 MSBA policy updates. Okay, those were given to you last month for your review. Um, I've been through them. I, I briefly went over them last month. Do you have any questions about them? We will need to adopt those policies as recommended by MSBA. Here and then, uh, we'll have uh, need a motion to adopt the 2017 MSBA policy updates. Uh, Mr. Johnson makes a motion. Do I have a second? Mr. Henry makes a second. Any discussion? Questions? <coughs> Here and none. All those in favor? Carries a 7 0. Next, uh, we'll do the review of the risk and alternative school program. Our alternative school program is used for a variety of reasons. Um, some of it is students who are not successful in a regular school setting, maybe for uh, medical reasons, discipline reasons, social reasons. It's a variety of reasons that students choose to go to alternative school. Um, we use it for the completion of credit program where students who have a grade of 50%, 50 to 59% in a core class can go and make up some time so that they can earn that half a credit for that semester rather than taking the whole semester over. We use it for credit recovery. This is during the summertime for students that need to make up a whole credit in whatever area that they need to. Um, we also use alternative school for the co-op program, our cooperative work experience program, where we give students release time. So if they have a job with the business in the community, they can get up to two to three hours of the school day off to go as release time to go work and get credit for that as well. And then this year we started using our alter alternative school program for our Spanish course. Um, we used um, a different online program last year, and that was not successful. And this year we're using our A-plus learning system that we have through the alternative school system, and, and that is working a lot better. For this eva evaluation, we surveyed six alternative school parents, 20 alternative school students, counselors, teachers, and administration. And our overall program average was a 4.16 on a scale of 1 to 5. This year, um, our number of students remained average with about 71 students. It looks bigger on that sheet because 96 of those students are in the Spanish course. We have 24 students who are taking courses in the alternative school program this year. Not all of them are full day students. We have blended schedules and I'll explain that a little bit later. But we haven't reached second semester yet and so that number will probably grow for those students that we are serving. We have increased the number of students in our co-op program, which is our work experience program. Last summer, we had an increase in students in our summer school program for credit recovery. And we had 10 students from alternative school who graduated last year, six of them on schedule with their kindergarten cohort. We had an increase in total number of credits earned at the alternative school last year with 93.5 compared to 67 the year before. So according to the survey, our strengths included blended schedules, and that's where we allow students to be in the alternative school program, maybe for a course or two. But if it, they have a strong interest in a class, like maybe the ag program or um, arts or something like that, then they're allowed to come out for those courses so that they, it kind of keeps them motivated to stay in the school. Another strength is one-on-one -on -one teacher assistance. It gives the opportunity for at-risk students to succeed with additional support. And another strength is it's a web-based program. So for students who are on homebound 
or for students who are have disciplinary issues where they cannot come to school, they can still access this program from home and still keep gaining credits. Concerns were um, less social interaction with other students, and they are isolated into one room, and less physical activities because they're not changing classes. You know, they're not up moving classes, and so their school day is shortened, and they're not going to lunch with other students. Right now, we have 13 available seats at one time, and we're not at capacity. Um, technology may need to be updated soon, but right now it's meeting our needs. Recommendations would be to involve younger students before they, before they fall too far behind. So we're going to be looking at those students who are in 9th and 10th grade this year at semester and seeing if there are some students who need to qualify for alternative school. Any questions? It's pretty good average when you, you survey 20 students to get 20 students to say anything positive sometimes is a challenge. Mm -hmm. um, plus seven parents. So it's a bit, I like that average. Thank you. We need to uh, approve that. So I need a motion to approve the uh, risk alternative school program review. Michael makes the motion. Uh, can you seconds? Uh, we had a discussion. Hearing none, all those in favor? Carries uh, 7 0. Next, uh, we'll have the uh, Special Services Program Review. We'll hit some of the highlights from um, the program review, starting with early childhood. We looked at the 16-17 school year. We had 18 students that ended our program. 100% um, of those finished the school year, increasing their progress by the time they exited in social-emotional skills, acquiring use of knowledge and appropriate action to meet their needs. So that was very good, and that was, um, we had 16 of those were in um, placements with their typically developing peers, so Head Start or our preschools. Um, we also finished the year with 180 students in placement. 102 of those were inside the regular classroom, 80% or more. That's ultimately our goal, is for those students to be with their peers as much as possible. So um, the target was 58%, and we were at 56.7. We had 55 in the classroom, 40 to 79 percent of the time. 19 less than 40 percent. Um, we had three that were either on homebound due to various reasons or hospitalized, and one that was in private school. I'll also look at our um, graduation rate, um, which looked at the previous year, which we hit on earlier. We had um, 16 of those students that had graduated from the previous year, and um, something I think is very good and it comes from Dr. Nash as well, they, we had 15 of those that were either employed or continuing their education. We'd like to see 100%, but I think 15 out of 16 is very good. That's our ultimate goal is to prepare all of our students for life after, after school, whether that is a career, college, or what they're looking at. Um, Currently, right now, um, when I did this, we had 197 students enrolled, 39 in the elementary, 49 in the middle school, 57 in high school, 81 district-wide were speech or language students, 44 of those are included up above and in other disabilities. So only 37 were speech or language only students. Early childhood, 15, I believe we're testing at least that many right now as well. It's a very busy time of the year. Um, Strengths, um, all the staff works very hard, works very well together to try to get lots of paperwork, timelines that, um, lots of legal, we have to keep on our timeline, so they work very diligent to get that. Um, weakness, we just lack of resources. We could always use more computers, um, iPads, and sensory items, and again, that falls into recommendations. Um, a high need, low functioning classroom, um, that would be for our um, intellectually disabled students that we have. Uh, behavior autism classroom and sensory rooms. We're seeing lots of students that have lots of sensory issues, um, so it would be that would be a very strong recommendation from all of our staff is to have a sensory room in each building where those students could have sensory breaks and address those needs. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we need to approve the uh, special services program review. So do I have a motion? 
Uh, Mr. Johnson makes a motion. Do I have a second? Uh, can we second? Do we have any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Carry seven up. Next, uh, we'll talk about the student advisory board position. It is about that time. Um, Dr. Nash, can you, I think you've been advertising for that, correct? Yes. Can you just remind them on the process you take? So the student advisory to the board, the position is from January to December. So in December, we usually start the process of looking for the next student that's going to be on the advisory board. So right now I have advertised students and I've talked to eight who are interested. I've received one essay so far. The deadline for the essays will be November 29th. Once we get all of those essays in, we will form a committee, one with the board member on it as well. So if somebody would like to serve on that, that would be great. Um, also some teachers and we narrow it down and then we narrow it down to probably two or three students somewhere around in there and then we give them a little bit of time to campaign and then we have an election at the high school and that would determine who takes this position and so we can announce that person at the December board meeting. Thank you. Next we'll discuss the uh, Belcher, Belcher Scholarship. Belcher Scholarship. So I think I have the votes from the board members, correct? So it looks like the choice was A. I want to make sure. Um, so I can announce that winner tonight. So the winner of uh, the, the Belcher Scholarship, um, the Board of Education does $250, $250 scholarship, and then this person moves on to the regional level, and if they succeed at the regional level, they move on to the state level where another scholarship can take place. But um, our local winner is Rachel Taylor. So we will be sending her scholarship on to the regional level. Okay. Well, I think that concludes our, our evening. Uh, no more action items. Our next regular board meeting uh, will be uh, December 21st, 2017 at 6.30 during the location. And school will be out by that point, but we will be here. All right. We'll have a motion to adjourn. Mike makes a motion to have a second. <coughs> Any seconds? Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? I'll carry seven out. Thank <laughs> you.